Hatchet, Chapter 14 Mistakes Small mistakes could turn into disasters. Funny little mistakes could snowball so that while you were still smiling at the humor, you could find yourself looking at death. In the city, if he made a mistake, usually there was a way to rectify it, make it all right. If he fell on his bike and sprained a leg, he could wait for it to heal. If he forgot something at the store, he could find other food in the refrigerator. Now it was different and all so quick, all so incredibly quick. If he sprained a leg here, he might starve before he could get around again. If he missed while he was hunting, or if the fish moved away, he might starve. If he got sick, really sick, so he couldn't move, he might starve. Mistakes Early in the new time, he had learned the most important thing, the truly vital knowledge that drives all creatures in the forest. Food is all. Food was simply everything. All things in the woods, from insects to fish to bears, were always, always looking for food. It was the great single driving influence in nature to eat. All must eat. But the way he learned it almost killed him. His second new night, stomach full of fish and the fire smoldering in the shelter, he had been sound asleep when something, he thought later it might be smell, had awakened him. Near the fire, completely unafraid of the smoking coals, completely unafraid of Brian, a skunk was digging where he had buried the eggs. There was some sliver of a moon and in the faint pearl light, he could see the bushy tail, the white stripes down the back, and he had nearly smiled. He did not know how the skunk had found the eggs. Some smell, perhaps some tiny fragment of shell, had left a smell. But it looked almost cute, its little head down and its little tail up as it dug, kicking the sand back. But those were his eggs, not the skunk's, and the half-smile had been quickly replaced with fear that he would lose his food, and he had grabbed a handful of sand and thrown it at the skunk. Get out of here! He was going to say more, some silly human words, but in less than half a second, the skunk had snapped its rear end up, curved the tail over, and sprayed Brian with a direct shot aimed at his head from less than four feet away. In the tiny confines of the shelter, the effect was devastating. The thick, sulfurous, rotten odor filled the small room, heavy, ugly, and stinking. The corrosive spray that hit his face seared his lungs and eyes, blinding him. He screamed and threw himself sideways, taking the entire wall off the shelter, screamed and clawed out of the shelter, and fell, ran to the shore of the lake. Stumbling and tripping, he scrambled into the water and slammed his head, back and forth trying to wash his eyes, slashing at the water to clear his eyes. A hundred funny cartoons he had seen about skunks. Cute cartoons about the smell of skunks. Cartoons to laugh at and joke about. But when the spray hit, there was nothing funny about it. He was completely blind for almost two hours a lifetime. He thought that he might be permanently blind, or at least impaired, and that would have been the end. As it was, the pain in his eyes lasted for days, bothered him after that for two weeks. The smell in the shelter, in his clothes, and in his hair was still there now, almost a month and a half later. And he had nearly smiled. Mistakes. Food had to be protected. 
While he was in the lake trying to clear his eyes, the skunk went ahead and dug up the rest of the turtle eggs and ate every one. Licked all the shells clean and couldn't have cared less that Brian was thrashing around in the water like a dying carp. The skunk had found food and was taking it, and Brian was paying for a lesson. Protect food and have a good shelter. Not just a shelter to keep the wind and rain out, but a shelter to protect. A shelter to make him safe. The day after the skunk, he set about making a good place to live. The basic idea had been good. The place for a shelter was right, but he just hadn't gone far enough. He'd been lazy. But now he knew the second most important thing about nature, what drives nature. Food was first. But the work for the food went on and on. Nothing in nature was lazy. He had tried to take a shortcut and paid for it with his turtle eggs, which he had come to like more than chicken eggs from the store. They had been fuller somehow, had more depth to them. He set about improving his shelter by tearing it down. From dead pines up the hill, he brought down heavier logs and fastened several of them across the opening, wedging them at the top and burying the bottoms in the sand. Then he wove long branches in through them to make a truly tight wall. And still not satisfied, he took even thinner branches and wove those into the first weave. When he was at last finished, he could not find a place to put his fist through. It all held together like a very stiff woven basket. He judged the door opening to be the weakest spot and where he took special time to weave a door of willows in so tight a mesh that no matter how a skunk tried, or porcupine, he thought, looking at the marks in his legs, he could not possibly get through. He had no hinges, but by arranging some cut-off limbs at the top in the right way, he had a method to hook the door in place. And when he was in and the door was hung, he felt relatively safe. A bear, something big, could still get in by tearing at it, but nothing small could bother him, and the weave of the structure still allowed the smoke to filter up through the top and out. All in all, it took him three days to make the shelter, stopping to shoot fish and eat as he went, bathing four times a day to try and get the smell from the skunk to leave. When his house was done, finally done right, he turned to the constant problem. Food. It was all right to hunt and eat, or fish and eat, but what happened if he had to go a long time without food? What happened when the berries were gone, and he got sick or hurt or, thinking of the skunk, laid up temporarily? He needed a way to store food, a place to store it, and he needed food to store mistakes. He tried to learn from the mistakes. He couldn't bury food again and couldn't leave it in the shelter because something like a bear could get at it right away. It had to be high, somehow high and safe. Above the door to the shelter, up the rock face about 10 feet, was a small ledge that could make a natural storage place, unreachable to animals, except that it was unreachable to him as well. A ladder, of course, he needed a ladder. But he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on, and that stopped him until he found a dead pine with many small branches still sticking out. Using his hatchet, he chopped the branches off so they stuck out four or five inches all up along the log. Then he cut the log off about 10 feet long and dragged it down to his shelter. It was a little heavy, but dry, and he could manage it. And when he propped it up, he found he could climb to the ledge with ease, though the tree did roll from side to side a bit as he climbed. His food shelf, as he thought of it, had been covered with bird manure, and he carefully scraped it clean with sticks. He had never seen birds there, but that was probably because the smoke 
from his fire went up right across the opening and they didn't like smoke. Still, he had learned and he took time to weave a snug door for the small opening with green willows, cutting it so it jammed in tightly. And when he finished, he stood back and looked at the rock face, his shelter below, the food shelf above, and allowed a small bit of pride to come. Not bad, he thought. Not bad for somebody who used to have trouble greasing the bearings on his bicycle. Not bad at all. Mistakes. He had made a good shelter and food shelf but he had no food except for fish and the last of the berries. And the fish, as good as they still tasted then, were not something he could store. His mother had left some salmon out by mistake one time when they went on an overnight trip to Cape Hesper to visit relatives, and when they got back, the smell filled the whole house. There was no way to store fish. At least, he thought, no way to store them dead. But as he looked at the weave of his structure, a thought came to him, and he moved down to the water. He had been putting the waste from the fish back in the water, and the food had attracted hundreds of new ones. I wonder. They seemed to come easily to the food, at least the small ones. He had no trouble now shooting them, and had even speared one with his old fish spear now that he knew to aim low. He could dangle something in his fingers and they came right up to it. It might be possible, he thought, might just be possible to trap them. Make some kind of pond. To his right, at the base of the rock bluff, there were piles of smaller rocks that had fallen from the main chunk, splinters and hunks from double fist size to some as large as his head. He spent an afternoon carrying rocks to the beach and making what amounted to a large pen for holding live fish. Two rock arms that stuck out 15 feet into the lake and curved together at the end. Where the arms came together, He left an opening about two feet across. Then he sat on the shore and waited. When he had first started dropping the rocks, all the fish had darted away. But his fish trash pile of bones and skin and guts was in the pond area. And the prospect of food brought them back. Soon, under an hour, there were 30 or 40 small fish in the enclosure and Brian made a gate by weaving small willows together into a fine mesh and closed them in. Fresh fish, he had yelled. I have fresh fish for sale. Storing live fish to eat later had been a major breakthrough, he thought. It wasn't just keeping from starving. It was trying to save ahead. Think ahead. Of course, he didn't know then how sick he would get of fish. And that's the end of chapter 14. Hatchet, chapter 15. The days had folded one into another and mixed so that after two or three weeks, he only knew time had passed in days because he made a mark for each day in stone near the door to his shelter. Real time he measured in events. A day was nothing not a thing to remember. It was just sun coming up, sun going down, some light in the middle. But events, events were burned into his memory, and so he used them to remember time, to know and to remember what had happened, to keep a mental journal. There had been the day of first meet. That had been a day that had started like the rest, up after the sun, clean the camp and make sure there is enough wood for another night. But it was a long time, a long time of eating fish and looking for berries. And he craved more, craved more food, heavier food, deeper food. He craved meat. 
He thought in the night now of meat, thought of his mother's cooking a roaster, dreamed of turkey, and one night he awakened before he had to put wood on the fire with his mouth making saliva and the taste of pork chops in his mouth. So real, so real, and all a dream. But it left him intent on getting meat. He had been working farther and farther out for wood, sometimes now going nearly a quarter of a mile away from camp for wood. And he saw many small animals. Squirrels were everywhere, small red ones that chattered at him and seemed to swear and jump from limb to limb. There were also many rabbits, large gray ones with a mix of reddish fur, smaller fast gray ones that he saw only at dawn, the larger one sometimes sat until he was quite close, then bounded and jerked two or three steps before freezing again. He thought if he worked at it and practiced, he might hit one of the larger rabbits with an arrow or a spear, never the small ones or the squirrels. They were too small and fast. Then there were the fool birds. They exasperated him to the point where they were close to driving him insane. The birds were everywhere, five and six in a flock, and their camouflage was so perfect that it was possible for Brian to sit and rest, leaning against a tree, with one of them standing right in front of him in a willow clump, two feet away, hidden, only to explode into deafening flight just when Brian least expected it. He just couldn't see them, couldn't figure out how to locate them before they flew because they stood so perfectly still and blended in so perfectly well. And what made it worse was that they were so dumb or seemed to be so dumb that it was almost insulting the way they kept hidden from him. Nor could he get used to the way they exploded up when they flew. It seemed like every time he went for wood, which was every morning, he spent the whole time jumping and jerking in fright as he walked. On one memorable morning, he had actually reached for a piece of wood, what he thought to be a pitchy stump at the base of a dead birch, his fingers close to touching it, only to have it blow up in his face. But on the day of first meet, he had decided the best thing to try for would be a fool bird. And that morning he had set out with his bow and spear to get one, to stay with it until he got one and ate some meat. Not to get wood, not to find berries, but to get a bird and eat some meat. At first the hunt had not gone well. He saw plenty of birds working up along the shore of the lake to the end, then down the other side. But he only saw them after they flew. He had to find a way to see them first, see them and get close enough to either shoot them with the bow or use the spear. And he could not find a way to see them. When he had gone halfway around the lake and had jumped up 20 or so birds, he finally gave up and sat at the base of a tree. He had to work this out. See what he was doing wrong. There were birds there and he had eyes. He just had to bring the two things together. Looking wrong, he thought. I am looking wrong. More, more than that, I am being wrong somehow. I am doing it the wrong way. Fine. Sarcasm came into his thoughts. I know that, thank you. I know I'm doing it wrong, but what is right? The morning sun had cooked him until it seemed his brain was frying, sitting by the tree, but nothing came until he got up and started to walk again and hadn't gone two steps when a bird got up. It had been there all the time. While he was thinking about how to see them, right next to him, right there. He almost screamed, but this time when the bird flew, something caught his eye and it was the secret key. 
The bird cut down toward the lake then, seeing it couldn't land on the water, turned and flew back up the hill into the trees. When it turned, curving through the trees... The sun had caught it, and Brian, for an instant, saw it as a shape. Shape pointed in front, back from the head in a streamlined bullet shape to the fat body. Kind of like a pear, he had thought, with a point on one end and a fat little body. A flying pear. And that had been the secret. He had been looking for feathers for the color of the bird, for a bird sitting there. He had to look for the outline instead, had to see the shape instead of the feathers or color, had to train his eyes to see the shape. It was like turning on a television. Suddenly he could see things he never saw before. In just moments, it seemed, he saw three birds before they flew, saw them sitting, and got close to one of them, moving slowly, got close enough to try a shot with his bow. He had missed that time and had missed many more, but he saw them. He saw the little fat shapes with the pointed head sitting in the brush all over the place. Time and again he drew, held, and let arrows fly, but he still had no feathers on the arrows, and they were little more than sticks that flopped out of the bow sometimes going sideways. Even when a bird was seven or eight feet away, the arrow would turn without feathers to stabilize it and hit brush or twig. After a time, he gave up with the bow. It had worked all right for the fish when they came right to the end of the arrow, but it wasn't good for any kind of distance, at least not the way it was now. But he had carried his fish spear the original one with the two prongs, and he moved the bow to his left hand and carried the spear in his right. He tried throwing the spear, but it was not good enough and not fast enough. The birds could fly amazingly fast, get up fast. But in the end, he found that if he saw the bird sitting and moved sideways toward it, not directly toward it, but at an angle, back and forth, he could get close enough to put the spear point out ahead, almost to the bird, and thrust a lunge with it. He came close twice, and then, down along the lake not far from the beaver house, he got his first meat. The bird had sat, and he had lunged, and the two points took the bird back down into the ground and killed it almost instantly. It had fluttered a bit, and Brian had grabbed it and held it in both hands until he was sure it was dead. Then he picked up the spear and the bow and trotted back around the lake to his shelter, where the fire had burned down to glowing coals. He sat looking at the bird, wondering what to do. With the fish, he had just cooked them whole, left everything in and picked the meat off. This was different. He would have to clean it. It had always been so simple at home. He would go to the store and get a chicken, and it was all cleaned and neat, no feathers or insides, and his mother would bake it in the oven and he would eat it. His mother, from the old time, from the time before, would bake it. Now he had the bird, but he had never cleaned one, never taken the insides out or gotten rid of the feathers, and he didn't know where to start. But he wanted the meat, had to have the meat, and that drove him. In the end, the feathers came off easily. He tried to pluck them out, but the skin was so fragile that it pulled off as well, so he just pulled the skin off the bird, like peeling an orange, he thought, sort of, except that when the skin was gone, the insides fell out the back end. He was immediately caught in a cloud of raw odor, a kind of steamy dung odor that came up from the greasy coil of insides that fell from the bird, and he nearly threw up. But there was something else to the smell as well, some kind of richness that went with his hunger, and that overcame the sick smell. 
He quickly cut the neck with his hatchet, cut the feet off the same way, and in his hand he held something like a small chicken with a dark, fat, thick breast and small legs. He sat it up on some sticks on the shelter wall and took his feathers and insides down to the water to his fish pond. The fish would eat them or eat what they could and the feeding action would bring more fish. On second thought, he took out the wing and tail feathers, which were stiff and long and pretty, banded and speckled in browns and grays and light reds. There might be some use for them, he thought, maybe work them onto the arrows somehow. The rest he threw in the water, saw the small round fish begin tearing at it, and washed his hands. Back at the shelter, the flies were on the meat and he brushed them off. It was amazing how fast they came, but when he built up the fire and the smoke increased, the flies almost magically disappeared. He pushed a pointed stick through the bird and held it over the fire. The fire was too hot. The flames hit the fat and the bird almost ignited. He held it higher, but the heat was worse, and finally he moved it to the side a bit where it seemed to cook properly except that it only cooked on one side, and all the juice dripped off. He had to rotate it slowly, and that was hard to do with his hands. So he found a forked stick and stuck it in the sand to put his cooking stick in. He turned it, and in this way he found a proper method to cook the bird. In minutes the outside was cooked, and the odor that came up was almost the same as the odor when his mother baked chickens in the oven. And he didn't think he could stand it, but when he tried to pull a piece of the breast off, the meat was still raw inside. Patience, he thought. So much of this was patience. Waiting and thinking and doing things right. So much of all this, so much of all living, was patience and thinking. He settled back, turning the bird slowly letting the juices go back into the meat, letting it cook and smell and smell and cook. And there came a time when it didn't matter if the meat was done or not. It was black on the outside and hard and hot and he would eat it. He tore a piece from the breast, a sliver of meat, and put it in his mouth and chewed carefully, chewed as slowly and carefully as he could, to get all the taste, and he thought, never, never in all the food, all the hamburgers and malts, all the fries or meals at home, never in all the candy or pies or cakes, never in all the roasts or steaks or pizzas, never in all the submarine sandwiches, never, never, never had he tasted anything as fine as that first bite, first meat. And that's the end of chapter 15.